Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the first in our new Side by Science webinar series. With me today is Dr. Christian Marshall from SeaKids Toronto Hospital. And Christian will present his talk on analytical validation of clinical whole genome sequencing for germline disease diagnostics, best practices and performance standards. We are happy to have you here connecting from your homes. My name is Shai, Shai Tsur. I'm a PhD in human genetics and Imagine CSO. I'm your host for this webinar. For those of you who don't know Imagine, we apply machine learning models to genomic analysis and interpretation in order to increase the capacity of genetic labs. The agenda of the series is driven by topics that are of interest to the labs we work with and the challenges they face. We are going to hand it off to Christian to get started with this presentation right away. At the end, we will share the results of an informal survey on the status and challenges of world genome sequencing adoption. Dr. Christian Marshall is the co-director of the Center for Genetics Medicine and also the associate director in the Department of Pediatric Laboratory Medicine at SeaKids in Canada. Today, Christian is going to present the work of the MGI Medical Genome Initiative, a consortium of leading healthcare and research organization in the US and Canada that was formed to expand access to high quality clinical world genome sequencing by publishing the best practices. If you have any questions, please type them into the QA widget below. We will spend a few minutes answering questions at the end. Christian, welcome. Uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Shai, for the, uh, the kind introduction. I'm just going to um, share my screen um, and put this in presentation mode. Great. I'm hoping everyone can see that okay. Um, well, thanks a lot for joining. I hope everyone is uh, uh, doing well, staying healthy. Um, as, as Shay said, I'm a, I'm a clinical lab director here at SickKids Hospital, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing. I, I've actually split the, the um, presentation into two parts. Uh, the first part, I will be introducing work we've done with the Medical Genome Initiative, um, a consortium that really is looking at trying to define best practices um, for the impl implementation of, of clinical genome sequencing. Uh, into healthcare, and then um, we're going to look a little bit at, at one of the uh, uh, papers that we're that we're um, trying to publish that is looking more at the analytical standards, um, and then I'll drill down a little bit uh, and, and do a bit more specific um, um, dive into some of the work we're doing at SickKids, specifically around a challenging aspect of validating a genome test, and that's the copy number variation analysis. So before, before I get into that, I think I just wanted to set everything up as to you know, why we're doing this. Um, so a lot of work that we've done in the past and of many others uh, around the world um, have been looking at using whole genome sequencing potentially as a single genetic test um, that can be used. Um, and so this is work that, that we did um, a couple of years ago um, and, and looking at the comparison of genome, uh, genome sequencing uh, versus standard of care um, for many of the clinics um, throughout SickKids. Um, and we found that the diagnostic yield was roughly, roughly double uh, compared with the use of standard testing. And I think what was really, um, which was really interesting and what we really noticed was, and, and this is per per perhaps not surprising, is, is the amount of genetic testing that needed to be done um, per, per patient. Um, so on average, um, there was three genetic tests that were done per patient, and then a microarray analysis was the one that was the, the most utilized. So our increase in diagnostic yield uh, for the genome sequencing was not just due um, to, to genes that were um, you know, not in the targeted tests that were done standardly, um, also due to things like non-coding um, um, variants, including deep intronic and also microRNA. So some things that you might not actually capture um, when using something like a, a whole exome sequencing technique. And we also found a lot of CNVs that were below the resolution of, of standard clinical microarray. And so this kind of really set the scene for so why we wanted to get this uh, into the into the into the clinic, um, and obviously there's a you know these are a couple of papers that we've published. Um, and Ryan Taft's group with Illumina has also published a nice paper looking at this as a as a first tier test, um, and then of course a lot of the work uh, done by Stephen Kingsmore at, at Radies has also shown the utility um, of genome sequencing um, um, for the diagnosis of of rare disease. Um, so 
genome sequencing is, is, is looking towards being a, a first line genetic test. Um, it may be very useful for this purposes, but the actual clinical validation of whole genome sequencing is quite challenging. And one of the issues right now is there's not a lot of standards in place. And of course, standards are very important. Um, it allows comparison between uh, laboratories and, and, and ultimately um, are, are important for the safety of patients. Um, a lot of the professional bo um, bodies out there, like the ACMG and, and, and CAP, et cetera, do have some um, guidelines for, for NGS testing in general. But I think a lot of the specific challenges of um, validating a genome, uh, a whole genome sequencing test are not really addressed by this. So with that in mind, um, a lot of colleagues uh, were, you know, we, we got to talking that we're all having the same sort of issues. Um, and so out of that was uh, created this medical genome initiative. And so um, as Jay um, described earlier, this is really meant to be, um, its mission is to expand access to high quality um, whole genome sequencing uh, for the diagnosis of rare germline diseases. Uh, and, and really what we wanted to do was uh, publish laboratory and clinical best practices for the implementation. And, and, and really this was towards the benefit, um, the greater benefit uh, to the group. Um, to, to, uh, to people in general that are looking to set this test up. And you can see below the, uh, the, the members, uh, the member institutions um, um, currently of the, of the consortium. And so one of the things that we first did um, was, was try to define a, a best, best practice topics roadmap, I suppose. Um, and we, we, we did this by looking at all the different aspects of, of um, how clinical genome sequencing would integrate into, into patient care. Um, including things like patient selection, laboratory testing, um, the diagnostic aspect of it, and then outcomes. Um, and, and within these, we split them into different types of over, overall themes um, that, that could be uh, under each of these categories um, and decided which ones or tried to prioritize which ones we felt there, there were some um, large gaps. And the idea here was to survey the group, um, survey the consortium, see what the practices were um, currently, and then try to derive some consensus around it. And so the one I'm gonna talk about today, um, the ones that are starred here are ones that we're, we have working groups for right now. But the one I'm gonna talk about today is, is the analytical validity of genome sequencing. So this was the first work group that we formed and it was one where we found like uh, we, could, we could benefit um, the, the community most um, by publishing. Um, and so this is best practices for analytical validation of genome sequencing. It's really intended um, as a little bit of a potentially, uh, you know, a, a current state as to what's happening with these institutions right now that have validated or are in the process of validating clinical genome sequencing. Um, we surveyed the group for, for current practice, and then we tried to define some consensus statements that were specific to genome sequencing around a lot of these key aspects that you, um, around a lot of the key aspects um, in the validation. So this, this figure here is a little bit more agnostic to actual clinical genome sequencing, but it really is taking us through the, the different steps um, that you might want to do when you're, when you're developing a lab-based test. Um, so these are the key steps. So we looked at test uh, development optimization, test validation, and quality management. Um, and then when, within each of these, we defined a lot of the activities, and this is essentially how the paper is broken down, um, a bunch of the activities that are needed. And we specifically looked at um, around uh, with, with clinical genome sequencing in mind, including things like test definition, um, measuring test performance, um, and then of course, quality control. And then the kind of outcomes that you would need uh, to have before you um, can offer this test. And so one of the things that we did was, was really after surveying the group was try to define um, a couple uh, consensus statements um, across um, a lot of these key steps here. And I'm just gonna briefly um, go over them within the paper itself. And at the bottom, you can see on our website, there is a preprint available. This, this paper is, is currently in, in, in review. Um, and obviously we break down um, a lot of these consensus statements uh, in, in much more depth uh, in the paper. So um, the, the really briefly, um, are, are some of our consensus statements are the test definition. Um, it was felt through the group that wherever possible, uh, you need to analyze and report on all possible detectable uh, variant types from genome sequencing. We realize that this is not necessarily easy thing to do. Um, genome sequencing is a very powerful technique but it's often difficult to be able to, to, to validate um, um, variant types um, up to a clinical standard. Um, at the very least, we recommended that 
that um, individuals um, would, when they validate a test, um, can report out on, on, on uh, the small variants uh, and also copy number variants. And, and this was sort of what we felt was viably, um, uh, viable as a minimal appropriate test. Um, number two was around test performance. Um, one, of the, one of the consensus here was that you know, related to number one in the test definition was that we should aim or meet, um, or you should be able to take that aspect of the genome sequencing and it should aim or meet or exceed um, that of any of the tests that's replacing. And the obvious tests that um, clinical genome sequencing would be replacing are, are um, whole exome sequencing and chromosomal microarray analysis. So during your test performance, you should be meeting um, at least those standards. Uh, number three is, is more of a, uh, a question around what genome coverage, because uh, that's a question that a lot of people will ask, what genome coverage do you need? Um, and rather than thinking about genome coverage, um, there's, a, there's a statement in there about looking more at genome completeness, and this gets to callability, meaning how well can you call a, a specific um, position. And then these are, um, these are the measures and the metrics and the performance metrics that should be much more used to define performance rather than just uh, straight coverage. Um, moving on, um, the, the last couple uh, consensus statements. Um, one of the other important questions that came out of this was, you know, what, what should you be using as reference standards and positive controls? Um, we know that for small variant types that a lot of the reference standards that are available, including the genome in a bottle and other NIST standards, um, um, are, 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 are very useful um, for measuring your accuracy of your small variant calling. Um, and so you don't really need a lot of controls for that or um, to be able to validate the test. However, where there's other um, more you know, more difficult regions of the genome to call, um, including other types of variant types, including copy number variants and, and maybe repeat expansions, which I've got an example here. Um, you often will need a large number of positive controls to be able to, um, to validate the test. Um, within that test validation framework as number five, uh, we felt like it, you should be looking at in several different dimensions. Um, including metrics that account for genome complexity, so how complex the region is, um, if it's repetitive or, or, or whatnot, or it's a more easy region to call, um, and obviously special attention to the sequence context um, and the variant type that you're calling. And so um, you, have to, you have to validate each variant type um, um, differently um, in, in relation to the sequence contents that's there. And then finally, uh, quality management. This is one question that we were you know, stuck with was how often do you need to run positive controls? And because the genome sequencing gives you so much data, it was really felt that um, ongoing quality control um, should include really the identification of a, of a comprehensive um, set of test performance metrics and the continual monitoring of these metrics. So if they meet certain level, then it's usually okay. Um, and then over time, you can use positive controls on a periodic basis, depending upon overall sample volume. So this is one of the recommendations that, we, that we're making, rather than having to run uh, necessarily a positive control uh, for every single batch. So that's outlining some of the brief um, consensus statements that came out. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, one of the, one of the things that we talked um, a lot about, um, and, and, and then maybe take a deeper dive into some of the stuff that we're doing here at SickKids that's in relation to this. So, um, we surveyed the, the group uh, and looked at what types of variants would they actually be um, um, offering um, and validating. And so you can see in blue, uh, these are the, uh, at the bottom, you can see the different variant classes that we have here, um, going all the way from the small variants, all the way to um, repeat expansions, more targeted pseudogene type analysis that would be include, uh, and, and including things like pharmacogenic testing, but also some of the things like uh, spinal muscular atrophy, where you can do targeted testing of um, um, some of these more complex regions. Um, and so you can see, that uh, not surprisingly, um, there's, there's, a, there's a range in what people are planning and, and, and validating right now. And so offering these at different stages um, as, their, as their test develops. And the thing I wanted to talk about today, um, a little bit more detail, was uh, the CNVs and structural variants. Um, and so we're defining here structural variants as sort of that all balanced and unbalanced variation that's greater than 50 base pairs in size. Um, obviously copy number variation is a, is a subset of the structural variation. Um, and we've split it up this way just because copy number variants and traditionally, at least for diagnostically, we're looking at um, larger variants and DELs and duplications that are at microarray resolution um, greater than 1 KB, although you could argue that a lot of the microarrays, um, uh, the resolution is, um, 
is 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 much high is is not as high as one kb. So a lot of the early lessons that we learned um, in looking at um, um, the analysis of copy number variants from uh, from genomes uh, we did uh, with the Genome Center. So this is a, a collaboration um, with the with the, the Center for Applied Genomics group here at SickKids. Um, where we, we actually broke this down and we looked a lot at the read depth algorithms that were used to call genomes. Um, we looked at a comprehensive evaluation of about six different read depth algorithms um, because there's dozens of them out there. So we were trying to, we were trying to figure out which ones would work the best. Um, and some of the lessons that we learned, um, you know, PCR free genome libraries are, is what's needed for CNBs because it has a much lower false positive rate due to um, PCR libraries that are for, for genomes. Um, the other thing that we learned from here, it was actually very difficult to determine a specific sequencing or analysis metric that predicts very poor performance CNV calling. I think there's uh, samples that look, you know, there's metrics that you can use where you know the CNV analysis isn't going to work, but it doesn't always necessarily correlate um, really well with what your final result is going to be. Um, within this paper, um, we had, we, after the evaluation, we we used a couple different um, uh, read depth algorithms uh, for the research going forward. So this was ERDS or ERDS and CNV Nader. Um, we, we had a combination of these for optimum recall. Um, but I think overall, what one of the lessons is it's also challenging to use um, sort of, you know, these open source programs because they're often not necessarily under development. At least it's a challenge as we start moving more towards uh, the, the clinical validation um, of, of these um, uh, of these tests. So at SickKids anyway, this is the uh, design uh, of, of clinical genome sequencing that we came up with. Um, so here we've got uh, the different reference types that we wanted to use. So these are reference standards. You can recognize some of them, uh, the genome in a bottle, plus the Asian and Ashkenazi Jewish trio. We also have done a lot of work with the uh, Craig Venter genome. Um, we have a lot of these in replicates. So the, the, the variant um, uh, validation that we're doing small variants and copy number variants. So these things that are a little bit larger, that are, that are uh, larger than one KB and then performance metrics I have over here. Um, and you can see that uh, for the, at least for a lot of the um, uh, small level or small variant calling, we don't necessarily need a lot of samples. Um, we do have some positive controls that have come back from clinical whole exome sequencing. So we've got about 20 of those that we're going to use. And then the CMA or the chromosomal microarray analysis, we've actually had to pick 31 samples. And I'll talk a little bit about how we built our, our truth set for this um, and, and how we evaluated it using our sensitivity and, and precision. So our overall goal, at least to break this down, was, was for CNV calling to, uh, to have an accuracy that's equivalent to the chromosomal microarray analysis and including um, up, to, uh, up to, the re to, the re to that resolution. Um, we really wanted to start with the read depth callers uh, with this just to make things a little bit more simple. Um, our analysis pipeline that we are using uh, is, is the Dragon, the Lumina Dragon um, um, program. Um, and so we wanted to be able to get down to 10 KB in size, because um, this is kind of the resolution of the uh, Affymetrix array that we were using. Um, and then the idea would be the orthogonally confirmed variants that are, that are smaller than this, um, it, it, just to um, uh, be able to call them, but also have to uh, move on to an orthogonal technique before signing out. Um, we also are, um, because taking advantage of the whole genome sequence, using uh, paired end um, reads and split reads as well. Um, but this will be introduced more as a rolling validation. And the, and the, and the reason for this is because you get so many variants um, that it, it can often be overwhelming to try to uh, uh, report these out. Um, so uh, our combination of reference standards and positive controls are used. So we, we are using, um, you know, the, the NA12878. We did a, a coverage experiment just to see um, how C and Bs were affected by different coverages. And this was also to decide what overall coverage that we might actually be wanting to sequence to. Um, so this was evaluated. And then we have this, as I said, a true set from 31 different um, positive controls um, that, with a range of different sizes uh, and types of pathogenic variants. And the one thing I, I also did want to mention was that, um, you know, reference standards, uh, I think for the single nucleotide and the smaller variants are, are very good right now. Um, but I think for CNVs, there's still a lot of work to be done. 
um, and, and, and are very much evolving. So this graph is really just meant to, to show you that, um, so this is here, so this is the, the, uh, the Venter uh, reference that we've been using. Um, it has about 23,000 um, variants in it. Um, and then you can see the genome in a bottle um, sample here. And then this is the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, proband, um, which has a, has a more complete or, or a larger number of variants that you can use. Um, for, um, for, for benchmarking. Um, and so just to show that these are quite disparate, um, and, and right now I think that these are evolving, but it, they're still not necessarily um, uh, you know, really, really good to use. However, it is something that, uh, that does need to be used. Um, and so in this, in this case, what we've done, um, you can see uh, this is for the uh, NA12878 benchmark. Uh, this is the recall and precision for deletion calling um, across um, across different depths of coverage. And as I said, the, the, the reason for this was trying to figure out whether we needed to, to go to a different depth. And we split into the different sizes, as you as you can see. Uh, overall, the, the results have showed, um, and this is this is using the, the, the Dragon CNV caller. However, our results are very similar using um, any other any other read depth caller. Um, but what you can see uh, is that, you know, in general, um, increasing depth doesn't really get you much uh, in terms of your uh, sensitivity um, at, at a lot of these levels, uh, it, it, especially once you go over 30x. So we were, we were happy to see this. Um, based on other data, we, we, are, we are planning to go to at least 40x um, for our clinical genomes. Um, the precision is the other thing I wanted to talk about here was because um, this is a, a you know a bigger issue um, with this, and I think that this actually goes back more to the benchmark. So you can see the relatively low uh, precision, um, and I think that this, in, in many instances, we've noticed um, that the calls are probably real, and they're just not necessarily in the benchmark. Um, uh, and 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 so I think that this is uh, you know one of those things that um, where, where as I said that the, these are. Um, the, the benchmarks are evolving, um, but it could indicate that there that there are issues. So I think you just have to um, take take the use of these with a uh, with a with a grain of salt. Um, so moving on to what we decided to build for our our true set um, for um, the, we are using our positive controls. So we've got a lot of experience here uh, doing uh, microarray analysis um, and, and signing out. So based on over twenty five thousand. Uh, chromosomal microanalysis reports signed out clinically. Um, what we did, and this is the work with uh, with one of the directors here, Jim Stravopoulos, we looked at the the most common um, deletions and duplications in genomes that we're signing out that are that are pathogenic, and so you can see them here um, in in terms of the aura. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that we could uh, include these in our positive control data set. So this is constructing this um, this CNV comparison. Um, you can see the the um, uh, the true set uh, and in si different size bins. So the idea here was to um, we we took these thirty one positive controls that we ran genomes on that we had clinical microarrays on. We ran genomes on them. Um, we have a, a split of losses and gains, uh, and we have done them over different size bins as well. Um, and this is just to kind of get a, a sense of of how well we can detect these. Um, the CNVs um, that were were sent uh, filtered um, from the true set, so um, we are looking at things with greater than uh, 25 um, probes on the Affymetrics array. Uh, we are looking at things that are greater than 10 kb in size. As I said, it's not like we're not going to be looking at things less than 10 kb in size. But what we wanted to do was validate this test at the resolution of the microarray. Um, we're also looking. Uh, we've also filtered based on rarity. So what we do is we we took the true set and, and narrowed this down to um, variants that are rare. Um, and one of the issues here is that common variants uh, in microarray and genomes are often displayed differently. And it's really hard to compare, especially if they're in messy regions. But because they're common, it's not something that we're that interested in, um, in, in validating anyway. Um, and and that's, so that's kind of in this last point here. We excluded a lot of the regions that are overlapping some of these complex regions, including uh, you know, telomeric uh, and, and centromeres. So one thing that we first started to do was to look at the uh, the sensitivity of the callers um, compared to the true set. So um, this happens to be, as I said, you know, in development, we, we were looking at ERDS and CNV nadir. Um, we wanted to move more towards a, 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 a solution that was being maintained. So that's why, um, and, and within the within the uh, the package um, that we're using. So this is when the within the Dragon software 
um, um, analytical pipeline. Uh, you can see the recall. So there's deletions in uh, reported and non-reported. So unreported means rare variants that are, uh, you know, things that we didn't necessarily need to report. Um, and then you can see the reported ones would be the ones that are pathogenic. Um, and you can see the duplications here as well. So this is giving a little bit more sense of the, the um, you know, how, how well we could pick up some of these, these variants. So, um, and, and the answer is very good. So you can see near 100% uh, near recall uh, for this uh, for the true set using these different um, algorithms. So we we're happy um, with the performance in this case. The other end of the coin here is is looking at um, precision. Um, so as I said, 100% of the re uh, reportable CNVs greater than 10 kb uh, were, were, were reported. So this is 109 in total. Um, and interesting, the precision is quite high as well. So this is just with the dragon collar um, that we're going to be using. Um, and deletions and duplications. So on average, we were um, over these 31 samples, actually, we weren't, we didn't get very many. Uh, we got about 10, 10 different uh, false positives over the size of, of, of 10 KB. Um, and, you know, about um, uh, 15 to 18 uh, false positive duplications. So this is really important because obviously one of the challenges is once you have your CNV analysis, you don't want, you, you need to make sure that you have high precision so that you're not chasing up a, a whole bunch of false positives. So that's a really quick uh, sort of overview um, of, of what we're doing at SickKids. Um, I just wanted to summarize um, by saying um, that um, clinical, uh, clinical genome sequencing is becoming really a first tier test in diagnostics, um, but the guidance for clinical implementation is, is really just emerging. Uh, so that's one of the reasons for the genesis of the, uh, of the medical genome initiative. Um, and, and we're providing some consensus recommendations for how to go about analytically validating uh, genomes. Um, and this is really based on the experience of the group. Um, we feel like uh, clinical genome sequencing should include small variants and copy number at a minimum. Um, and really it should be at a, at a place where it can replace whole exome sequencing and chromosomal microarray analysis. Um, the validation of copy number variants using um, uh, from, from whole genome sequencing is quite complex. It's a lot of technical challenges in calling the CNVs and a lot of difficulty in obtaining reference, standards, uh, reference um, standards um, and, and, and also a very efficient way to uh, annotate and interpret the variants as well. So there's a, there's a whole, um, it, it's very challenging to do this. Um, and that's why we're taking sort of uh, smaller steps and we will we'll be able to do um, smaller variants and other, other algorithms um, later on. So that includes our future work. Uh, it's really expanding the whole genome sequencing analysis to include more complex structural variants and then further uh, downstream moving into repeat expansions um, and pharmacogenic variants as well. So I'll just end with um, acknowledgments. Um, uh, all the individuals here in genome diagnostics um, that have helped with this, especially with, uh, especially Lynette Lau, who has done a lot of the, uh, the, the, the informatics lead on this, and informatics obviously is a, is a big challenge um, in doing this analysis. Um, uh, uh, great collaborations with the people at Illumina as well. Um, the Center for Applied Genomics, which is the research genome center here, um, we, we, we work on a lot of things with them and then translate them over to the diagnostic lab, the Center for Genetic Medicine, and then of course um, the expertise within the, the medical genome initiative. Um, you can see a lot of the members here that have worked on this uh, analytical uh, validity paper and just to acknowledge some of the funding and, and collaborative partners. Um, so thank you. Thanks for listening. Uh, I think we'll get to questions in a minute, but may maybe first I'll, I'll hand it back to the, uh, to the host. Thank you, Christian, for taking the time to share your research with us. It uh, looks very promising. So before we jump uh, into the QA, I just want to share the results of our, our informal survey here. We can learn a bit about the issues raised by the audience. So the first question was, when labs plan to offer whole genome sequencing? As you can see, 26% of the respondents indicated that they currently offer whole genome sequencing, and 37% are in the validation or planning phases. The next question was, uh, what is the most challenging aspect of clinical whole genome sequencing? And you can see here that the uh, bioinformatics pipeline calling and validation was consider the primary challenge, but uh, close second was the interpretation challenges in, partic in particular within the intronic regions. Okay, so we have a few questions here. Uh, 
let's uh, start. Uh, first, uh, my question. MGI is a big consortium. How easy or difficult is to come to a consensus on topics like this? Yeah, so that's, that's a, it's a great question. So we had a, we had a working group um, that, did, that went through the analytical validation paper. As I said, we started out with a survey of, of kind of the landscape of what everybody was doing. Um, and, and consensus is hard. Um, and I think, you know, the expertise within that group is, is phenomenal. Um, and there are slightly different ways uh, to do things. So, I mean, we even got into discussions about calculating something like genome coverage and there's, there's different ways to do this. Um, and so building consensus, um, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with very, very specific numbers, uh, which is why the paper is, is, is more built around um, general themes. Um, however, where we could, we wanted, to, we wanted to give specific things that we could agree on. So it is very hard to build consensus. And the reason for that, in, at least in this, in this technology, is that there's lots of different ways to do things and they're all probably equally valid. Um, and so I, I think that was one of the, one of the challenges of, of, of you know, writing a paper uh, on this. Yes. Um, why are you focusing on larger deletions and applications when whole genome sequencing is capable of higher resolution with other types of colors? This is the second question. Yeah, so this is, so this is a, it, it's, a, it's another great question. I mean, obviously the, the power of, of, of using whole genome sequencing is that you can detect um, variants that are, that are quite small um, and down to the resolution that's beyond, um, you know, what we're currently using, um, especially when you're, when you're looking at something like using whole exome sequencing for copy numbers or, or our clinical um, microarrays. Um, and so, you know, we, we wanted to take, as I said, uh, some baby steps um, to this uh, and be able to offer a, a test that wouldn't take forever to interpret and analyze. So we were kind of cutting it off at a, at a, at a, certain, at a certain level. And not to say that we won't continue to validate uh, and continue to increase the resolution of what we report at. The other, the other major problem, as I kind of mentioned, is that some of the, the, the reference standards out there, the reference standard samples out there and the benchmarking data sets um, are, are not necessarily complete. So you find at a, a low resolution, you find a lot or a high resolution, I should say, you find a lot of variance in that sort of 50 base pairs up to uh, one KB. And it's really difficult to get a really accurate sense or a really good sense of what the accuracy of that variant calling is. And I think as a clinical lab, uh, it's, it's something that's going to be difficult for us to be able to um, sign out. So I think um, trying to figure out um, how to, how to, cause that just leads into an interpretation. So trying to figure out how we, how we can actually interpret those variants um, that are, that are much smaller is going to be a challenge. So I, that's why we, we've started with something that's a little bit more uh, easy because uh, it, it'll essentially just replace what the resolution of micro is. Yes, so I guess you don't have yet uh, recall and precision numbers for CNVs uh, in, a, in size uh, less than 10 KB, I guess. Right. Uh, so what about regarding the validation of CNV calls? Can you share when do you recommend to perform additional validation of a CNV that was identified by the whole genome sequencing? Yeah, so again, I think this is a really good balance between trying to figure out, uh, you know, what resolution you want to go down to and, and where you'll need some orthogonal confirmation. I mean, I can tell you that our plans are, um, you know, in, in, or our plan is in, is in offering clinical genome sequencing, uh, we will be running some microarrays in parallel for some time uh, just to ensure that we are capturing everything. And then there is an orthogonal technique uh, to be able to, um, to, to, to confirm the call. Um, I, I think in general, the, the issue is going to be variants that are smaller than the resolution of the, of the micro. Like I said, we will be looking down to 1 KB in size. Um, and the, so the reason why we've cut it off at 10 KB um, is because we're pretty confident in our numbers, um, as I showed, and we don't feel like we need to necessarily validate um, 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 CNVs uh, at that level. However, if we find uh, what we think is a medically relevant variant um, below the resolution of what, our, of what our validation is set up to be, 
uh, we will do orthogonal confirmation. And in that case, we would be doing um, probably a, like a targeted qPCR assay. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you also talk about the difficulty in annotating and filtering CNVs? Yeah, so so that's a that's a huge thing, and I, I was I was looking at the survey that you did, and that's um, I you know I would have said the same thing. So the informatics around that and the um, uh, and the interpretation is a huge challenge, um, and so you know we've built sort of custom pipelines to be able to annotate our CNVs. Um, and the, and the, the, the most useful thing to, to be able to filter out um, um, CNVs that probably aren't relevant is really having a good control data set. And in our experience, you almost have to have um, the genomes called with exactly the same algorithms uh, to be able to figure out what the frequency of that variant might be. But that's your, that's your easiest way to, to filter or at least get rid of um, um, what we would consider more common variants so you can get down to the rare variants. Um, and then in terms of the, you know, other than that, like the, the filtering itself, I think, you know, some, some sort of ease uh, of being able to, I mean, we have an SOP where we can go through and filter based on frequency and filter based on, um, on whether it's impacting a gene or not. Um, but I think that these are things like platforms like Imogene and others will need to really uh, work on uh, in the future because it, it's, it's, it's not as easy as, as the uh, SNVs. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult. And, um, you know, I, I, I really do think that, uh, you know, it, it, trying, to, trying to figure out an automated way to do this is, is uh, going to be a challenge. And uh, what is the approach you are taking for uh, comparing the NGS results from genome sequencing, uh, CNV calling to the CMA results? how you can um, uh, say that this CNV is the same as the CMA, for example, yeah. what is your approach that you're Yeah, so that's a, that, that's a great question. And that, that is one of the challenges, even in that annotation is trying to figure out whether, um, whether you are seeing the same thing. Um, so at least in our case, uh, what we're doing is, is looking at um, a, 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 a reciprocal overlap. Um, and so if there's, I, I think, I think what we did in this case was if there was 70% reciprocal overlap, then we would, you know, consider it the same variant. So by reciprocal overlap, meaning, um, it had to be a two way, a two way comparison. Um, it's absolutely true that the, the breakpoints of these are going to be slightly different, um, based on the probes within the, within the microarray. Um, and so this works relatively well for larger variants. Once you do start to get to smaller variants, uh, where probes can be spaced further apart, um, either because of resolution or because that there are segmental duplications in the way, um, you do run into challenges in making these comparisons. So um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and the, the best advice I can offer right now is to use a reciprocal overlap. Um, and then you might have to manually look at some to see if it's, uh, if it's there or not. We did a lot of manual looking at both array data and at the BAM files from the, from the genomes to ensure that um, they matched up. Okay, uh, another question is regarding the drug and bioinformatic pipeline. Uh, you mentioned that you use this mainly. Uh, is there a reason for that? And uh, using it for maybe you use a combination of different variant colors. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a, explain so, about this. Yeah, so it's another, it's another great question. I didn't have time to get too much into it, but it, you, so one of the issues um, that, that we've had in the past uh, that I kind of touched on is that um, Often, I, I think for variant calling right now, for small variant calling, you know, GATK is a very good program. It works really well. Um, and, but in our, at least in our analysis that we've done recently for the small variants, um, we found Dragon to perform very well, especially for indel calling um, and to outperform it. So we kind of wanted to make, make that switch. It's also very fast um, as well. Um, so we, we felt like it was, uh, you know, something that we wanted to switch to. Um, and our, I think our biggest challenge is trying to figure out how to do the CNV calling. Um, and so within that, within the Dragon platform, there are, there's a read depth caller, which I presented today, and then it uses Manta as well for the structural variants or more for the, the paired in and split read. Um, so in our evaluation, at least, the read depth caller is working as well as what we had, um, had evaluated in that, in that paper. Um, that I showed uh, with the urge and CNV Nader. Um, and so 
that's one reason why we wanted to use it was it was part of the, it, it's just kind of more of an efficiency thing. It's, it's this part of the same um, software package. And we didn't necessarily want to be in a clinical lab running a bunch of different callers and trying to piece them together. And the final piece is that we are looking for more of a solution in the clinical lab that uh, is, will be con constantly maintained. Um, one of the challenges that we have found in the past is um, running into some issues with some, soft, some programs or softwares or analysis uh, algorithms that have been written and are potentially not updated anymore. Um, so they're a bit more static and they were done on the research side. They work very well. It's just a bit more of a challenge to maintain them. Great. Uh, could you comment on the clinical utility of RNA sequencing in rare disease diagnosis? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. It's, a, it's, um, it's something that we're working on uh, in, in, in parallel here. Um, it is setting up a, a, a more of a clinical RNA sequencing pipeline. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is that it, I think it works really, really well in some cases and in others, um, I, I wouldn't use it as a first line test. Um, but I think as we move much more into genomes, uh, I think it becomes more and more, more and more useful. And part of that is because of trying to interpret a lot of the non-coding variation and, and what it actually means. Um, so, I, I mean, the clinical utility of the RNA sequencing, uh, where we found it works really well, um, you know, the cancer group, it works really well, obviously, because you can look for very specific things. Uh, and we've had some success in using it uh, more, more in mus uh, musculoskeletal disorders um, and, and muscular dystrophies, um, often because you have the, the piece of tissue um, uh, that, that's affected uh, and you've got good expression. Um, so I, I think that I think it's still out. I mean, you know, the jury's out a little bit, um, but I, I do see that as a technique that will be important to use to help or as an ancillary or a complement, especially to genome sequencing um, as we go forward to be able to uh, better interpret um, some of the some of the variation that we're seeing in the genome and vice versa. Okay. Yeah. I think one last question. There was a publication recently in, in BioArchives by Tsuk et al, a, a robust uh, benchmark for germline structural variant detection. It is consists of the Ashkenazi tree, your son. It was, uh, is, are you recommend to use that as a benchmark for CNV? And, and, and does MGI group uh, are looking for another way to standardize the CNV calling uh, preparing a new benchmark for CNV calling and SV calling. Yeah, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, um, the, the, the paper, um, the, 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 especially the, the NIST group, the, the GA for GH, um, I think have come up with some really good standards. And of course, Justin Zook's uh, work. Um, and, and so I, I didn't show the data today, but this is what we are working on now is, is actually, I, I would recommend using um, as a benchmark, you can use NA1287A, um, but I think the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, offspring is, is probably a more complete benchmark, um, and I would recommend using it. I still think there's uh, some, some holes in it, but um, I think it's probably, uh, you know, one of the better um, standards that you're going to get um, out there right now. So um, I do recommend using that. Um, the second part of the question was the, the MGI group. Um, so... You know, our analytical validity work group, uh, we've, we've taken a pause on it. However, I, I do think that we, you know, it, it was important for us to keep it going in the sense of, of, of to try to, um, because the field is moving so fast and evolving so quickly, was to keep having meetings or keep having um, our, 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 our working group calls to discuss issues like this and, and, and where we want to go next. I mean, me personally, um, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking at the repeat expansion work that you can do from, from genomes. I think that that's one place where we would like to uh, implement quickly. So um, it, it is a possibility that, uh, you know, the MGI group might be looking, taking a bit deeper of a dive into some of these things uh, that, we, that we identified in the paper that are challenges. Okay. I think uh, that's all for now. There are a few more questions. Uh, maybe we can answer them by email. Uh, Christian, thank you again. And before you, you head out, I'm going to share a quick poll with you. We'd love your feedback. And thanks again, again for being with us. 
Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Christian.